Mustafa Nayem is a Ukrainian parliamentarian, journalist, and democracy activist. He's also the 2014 recipient of the Jan Ratzio Democracy Award, and I want to congratulate you on the award up front. Congratulations. Thank you. How does, how does winning this award uh, fit into your larger work? You know, I get knew about this just last year, and I, that time was journalist yet. So for me, it's, it's like something from my last life, you know, as uh -huh. previous life, because it's, as a journalist, I was awarded. And uh, now it's, you know, I like that I'm the same way in democracy in Ukraine, because I'm now a member of parliament. We do the same things, but not as a journalist. Do you miss being a journalist full time? Very. Yeah, hard to get, hard to leave that. It's behind. very hard because when you're a journalist, you can, you know, you can be objective. You shouldn't be involved in process, and you are just not responsible for this process. You're just describing this process. Now I'm responsible. And that's a big problem because our audience asking you. Before that, we just tell them what is going on. Now they're asking why you did nothing, and it's. it's a little bit complicated. It's early in your career as a politician, but wh what are the early returns telling you as far as which is the better position to change the world, being a journalist or being a politician? Mm, I don't know yet, because actually no. for me it's a big question. Uh, from one side, being a journalist, you, are very, you can be very aggressive, and you can push, you can press, and you can ask. From the other side, when you're inside the system, you can understand that before that you didn't know nothing about the system. Mm -hmm. Now you should build some coalitions, you should build your team to make your maybe party or something like that to move something. And it's very, very slowly because when you're a journalist. A big learning curve. Yeah. Lots to learn. Who's helping you in that regard? Who helps a, a new member of parliament learn how things work? Mm, you know, there are a lot of NGOs and think tanks in Ukraine who, are, who helps us with the expertise of legislation, and uh, we are learning and studying in different courses because we don't have systematic knowledge in economy or in energy system. So this is long-term distance, I think. I, I was listening to a, a BBC feature about you, and there was a really interesting uh, part in there where you had a meeting with Francis Fukuyama, yes. and that was formative for you. you tell us about that, what you learned and how you applied that to your activities. You know, I think I can say that it's he, the Francis Fukuyama, is the godfather of me as a politician because huh. actually he pushed me to this idea. We have been in Stanford for three weeks. We met there, and one of the lectures uh, was about social mobilization. And uh, we talked. We have big discussions, argues. And one time he asked me, "Why you are not going to politicians?" And I told him that you know it's very dirty play. You 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 can't be clean there. And we had. A lot of discussions, and the end of discussion, I started to think about it. He just, actually, he, the seeds in my, ha in my head was put with the, by uh, Francis Fukuyama. And when I came back to Ukraine, I started to do something with that. It was like illness, you know, you can't stop it because mm -hmm. you think that it's maybe a better way to use your, your resources, to use your accomplishments to do something. So, thanks to him, I became member of parliament. And do, do you find that there's any advantage being a known media personality as a member of, of parliament? Do people have certain expectations for you that are uh, positive or negative? You know, um, I would say that more negative because people expect from you something radical new. They, they think you're a rebel. Yes. No, it's not rebel. Mm -hmm. When you're, you know, famous person as a journalist, it doesn't mean you can be the same famous in political life. From one side. From the other side, a lot of our audience, they think that we betrayed them. Because you were objective on side of people and now you're getting politicians. And it's very, very hard to convince them that, you know, this is just proceeding of my life. The same values, just the same things, but from the other side. Now, the, for three months, it looks like people, they understand that. My audience, they understand that. They understand that we are not the same. We are going to change something. And we are really changing a lot of things. And it's true. It's very hard because we are, sometimes we look like freaks in Parliament. But from the other side, people understand that we are from on, on their sides, not mm -hmm. on the side of politicians or oligarchs. So this, I hope that someday people will say, OK, politicians and member of Parliament are the same people regular people from the streets. They are not some, some someone from gods, from the Olymp. And we are going toward that process.
And, and how would you characterize the current situation? You feel like you're making progress. Are, are, is, is crisis uh, the word that you would use? A lot of people externally talk about a crisis, especially as they speak about Russia's invasion. W how would you characterize the circumstances? I would say that in Ukraine we have two wars. One war is with the Russia and Russian troops in our border and uh, those terrorists. And other war we have inside our country, in Kyiv which is with those old-fashioned politicians and oligarchs linked member of parliament who are trying to use the war to save the status quo. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very complicated. Which is the tougher enemy? Um, for me as a politician, those who are closest to me. I mean politicians. But from the other side, a lot of politicians, they're using these motos of patriotism, motos of war to, to save their money and positions. And it's very hard to fight against them because they're, they're supported by people. I want to take you back to the, the Maidan protests and uh, your use of social media as yeah. a, a rallying tool. You know, we've heard a lot about this as a powerful tool that can topple governments, mm -hmm. particularly in the Arab Spring. Talk about how powerful it really is from someone who's actually experienced it in the trenches. Uh, do mm -hmm. we overstate how significant it can be, or can it really be this really useful, powerful tool? And then I'd like you to talk about whether or not you've learned lessons from that experience mm -hmm. that can apply to your current work. You know, you're right that it, it's only tool. Tool you can use when you have some, some, some atmosphere, yes, when you have yeah. some preconditions. We had those preconditions. Facebook and Twitter just made it faster. It's very good tool for communication, but it is very bad tool to manipulate people. Why? Because, you know, in Internet, uh, you feel how frank and how honest is your audience much faster than for you right, in, in TV or when you're talking to people because you can read a lot of information. You have a lot of yes, as well. yes, feedback. It's very fast feedback. So it's a very good tool. From one side, from the other side, a long, for a long time, for three years, we, we, we tried to use Facebook and uh, Twitter to uh, mobilize people because we just talked talk to them that we should do something and people did nothing. Just why? Because people, when you're protesting in Facebook, you are not doing the same things out offline. And this transition from online to offline, it's much more complicated than we thought before. We, for example, we had the same things in Moscow, you know, in 2011 when they had this Bolotnaya. Yes, they had protests and it was very complicated to put people from online to offline. A hashtag alone is not a social movement. No. <laughs> it takes more than that. <laughs> yes. So when we met on the streets, it was easier to use Facebook. But this transition, it's, I, it's magic. I will will you continue to use these tools I I as a politician? Yes, uh, I, because you know, when you're a journalist, you're on the air every day. Yes, when you're a politician, just if you're a newsmaker. This big problem for journalists who became parliament, parliamentarian. But from the other side, I have a lot of big audience in Facebook, maybe one, one, 170,000 people who followed me. And it, it is a very good tool to communicate with them, explain what you're doing, and you, you, you feel feedback. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't like feedback, but okay. Right. You're good and bad. I have it. Uh, one final thought is about the, the role of the international community in, in Ukraine. How can they be of assistance? Is the, are, are the problems Ukraine needs to deal with things that have to be dealt with internally, or are there things that can be done positively by countries on the outside who are inclined to, to in, be involved in a positive way? Mm, you know, after Crimea, annexion of Crimea, you know that Russia annexed our territory was period in this period that lasts today, is that we think, and a lot of people in Ukraine think that they are betrayed. Why? Because we had Budapest, Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed us sovereignty and integrity. And these guarantees of this uh, agreement was United States, Great Britain, and Russia. And now we've lost our territory, and no one guaranteed nothing. And even more, they're discussing to help us or not to help. And that's the question for us. If we are going to do something uh, in the future together, who should we believe? Okay, we don't believe Putin. Do we believe West? Mm -hmm. And that's the question for Ukrainian people. And it's much more tougher question if you're losing every day 10, 12, 20 people. They are dying, they're injuring, and that's question for us. Because in 1994, we agreed to refuse from nuclear state. Yes, 
and we gave to the world 1,000 missiles, nuclear missiles. Now we even can't have some assistance in defensive equipment. That's a question for us. Why? And wh how are you going to convince other nuclear states to do the same things? That's a question not for today. It's a question for tomorrow. And other question is that we had the same situation in 1939 when Hitler attacked Poland mm -hmm. and French and other European countries. They were just mutually agreed with that. And they were hesitating. Are we going to, involved, to be involved in this process to interfere this attack or not? Are we going to protect Poland or not? And then Hitler attacked Gdansk and World War II started. We have the same situation now. Are, are you closer now to a potential resolution of the conflict with Russia, or are you closer to escalation? Mm, you know, I want to have some solution. But the questions I have in, in, my, in my heart is that, tell me the reasons why Putin should stop. I don't know these reasons. He doesn't afraid, because we don't have little uh, uh, weapon. He don't want to fulfill agreements. And he's fell in love with his idea to control this territory. And he encountered West, which is very pragmatic, and hesitating, help or not. These two conditions and these two moments, it looks like escalation is unavoidable. And the question is, that are we ready to recognize it today, to stop it tomorrow? Or we are going to wait when this escalation will happen? Well, it's an ominous note to end on, but we're out of time. But I want to uh, thank you again for joining thank us. You. Congratulate you on your uh, recent you. election and also on the Rachi Award. Thank you. Thanks. A pleasure to meet you.